Good evening, everyone. It's Jackie Van Work. I'm founder of Grieving Moms Finding Hope, and welcome to Hope After the Landslide. It's Tuesday night at 6 p.m., and we try to be here each week to deliver a message of some hope and healing. We are a community of grieving moms that um, God just put on my heart a couple years ago, and I just continue to want to make sure that whoever God places in my path is uh, going to just have that opportunity to have some resources to be able to know that there's still life that goes on after our landslide the day that our son or daughter went home to heaven. Now, many of you have um, been asking me to talk a lot about shame. It seems as though this has been something that we all are carrying around. And I know I've, I've had, you know, about a bit here and there. So I'm hoping that what this message is going to put on my heart is going to help to be able to break up uh, and clog the flow of the Holy Spirit. Hi, Austin. How are you, sweetheart? Hi, Margie. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Adela. I'm going to try to reach out as much as I can while I'm uh, reading some of this information. Hi, Martha. So some of you may or may not be familiar. And first off, I want to give credit to uh, the pastor at my church, Pastor Ben Fleming. He delivered the message that um, inspired me to be able to do this message on shame because it's from, and I had put on the, the notes to be sure that maybe you guys had a chance to read it. If you don't, I would encourage you to read it after, which is in Samuel 13, 1 through 22. Hi, Karen. And the story is about David's family. I think David, after you know he had slept with Bathsheba and had a lot of the sin in his life, that there was going to be perhaps a lot of death in his family, accordingly to perhaps a sin that he had committed. And uh, so one of his sons, his very firstborn son, actually, Amnon, decided that he really was lusting a lot over his sister Tamar. And some of these biblical names are really hard to pronounce. But um, he lusted over her instead of truly loving her. He set it up to where he wondered how could he get her in a room alone without anybody knowing. And he was told by another relative of his, why don't you pretend to be sick and just insist on having her come in and, you know, prepare meals for you. And when she did come into the room, that's when he took advantage of her. So hence begins this journey of shame. So in, in verse uh, 20 of this particular chapter, it said, then her brother Absalom said to her, has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house as a desolate woman. So do you think that Tamar was to feel as though she needed to be blamed and to experience shame for something that she absolutely had no control over? But she did. And this is one of the games that Satan will continue to play on us. And in the, in the day, back in the biblical day, the daughters of the kings were to wear this beautiful robe. And it was probably covered in jewel and everything. But as Tamar came out of the room after her brother had raped her, she literally tore the robe, hence starting the beginning journeys of shame. And she put ashes all over her head. Now, I was looking up earlier what that was, but I'm sure that um, there's some biblical root to that, and I actually will dig further, but I did want to provide some false information. But I found it very profound. They were very symbolic back then. They did things like that. Uh, let me take a moment here. Hi, Luann. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Tammy. Uh, thank you for all of the likes and for you guys being here. So before I go into this whole process of shame and perhaps how God wants us to get out of it, I want to share my story of shame. I have a lot, but the one I will share with you relates to after my son passed away. So my daughter, we'll call her my daughter, as you know, but she's my daughter in love. She was married to Randy's Marseille and the two boys and her dad moved back to California to try to pick up the pieces. We all did under the same roof. So Part of the journey was to try to make the boys' lives to be go back into as much place of normalcy if, as we can, right? And we took them to a preschool, and I remember that it was my job to volunteer to walk them into the preschool. And 
I parked the, the car, I got them out of the truck. They were all cute, their hair slicked back, and you know, yet they're still, you know, visibly having scars on their face. And now the grandmother, me, is walking with them into the classroom to meet the teacher. Now, most of the teachers, they did know the story. I don't know to what extent that they did know it, but now here I am, the mother of this son of mine, their daddy that did this to them. And what kind of a woman, how did I raise you know, my son? All the lies that I started to believe and the shame was just, I was immersed in the shame. And hi, Tammy, um, and viewing from Redding, California. Hi, Lisa. Um, yes, I know it's a heavy topic. Uh, she said, thanks for discussing this tonight. And so I, I just allowed the darkness to consume me. And lo and behold, one of the teachers just happened to be a friend of ours through a different set of circumstances. And when I found out that she was one of the boys' teachers, I, I still felt shame because she didn't know me that well to know what my family was like, but we had been in this community for a long time and raised our boys and we did all kinds of fun things within the community with our neighbors, did a lot of trips and, and it was considered the all American apple pie kind of a family, if you will. I mean, sure we had our struggles and, and challenges, but at the end of the day, we were just the average family. But now I'm personally, cause we're talking about shame, carrying my shame to this place and to many places. And, then as my relation began with the teachers and they got to see who I was, the shame started to lift, but I felt like there were times that I almost had to go way out of my way. I didn't change who I was, but I really took those extra steps just to say, hey, look, like, you know, I did, there's nothing in, in our history and also protecting my son. So that's something that has been a long process to get through. I mean, even going into the hospital to visit the boys in Marseille and her dad when this first happened was they wouldn't let us even come upstairs to go and visit them because, you know, we are the, the family, this, the parents of this boy that did this to the family. And um, I cried a lot. I honestly, I, I did. I cried a lot. I wanted to share that I, Marseille gave me the idea to look up this book. And I don't know if you've heard of it, but I'm going to highly recommend it. It's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Peter Scazzaro. And in that, I ordered the audio tape last night. And I actually listened to it long enough to where I fell asleep. But I got in what I needed to for that particular moment. And in this, he's more interested, as God is, in your emotional healing in order to be able to have a close relationship with Jesus. And he discusses 10 ways and ouch, you know, it can be hurtful and I'm not here to hurt anybody and I'm going to not go through all 10 of them. But the one that I pulled out because of what this topic is, was the one that said, saying that we are spiritually immature when we are covering our brokenness, weakness, and failure. And there's, a, and there's nine other really, really good ones. And some of them may apply, some of them may not. But I want to address the first word, brokenness. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit in Psalm 34, 18. And then in weakness. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made in weaknesses, insults, hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And then in failure is my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever, Psalm 30 or 73, 26. So any time that you start feeling the shame and you've got this brokenness inside you, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to allow it to continue to control you and keep you stuck? I want you to ask yourself that now and then in prayer time, because God's word God is the healer. He is the ultimate counselor. He is all those things. And do you think for a moment that God wants you to be stuck in this place of feeling shame and blame? And Pastor Rick had said one time, what is blame, which is be lame. And I love that. And that, again, that's a little harsh because of our situation. So Satan wants you to experience all of these words that start with the letter D. I'm sure that a lot of them are familiar to you, but I pulled up a couple of extra ones in addition to the ones that you may already know. Discouragement, division, deceit, despair, depression, desolation, disappointment, distant, deception, and defenselessness. 
These are all things that he wants you to be because ladies, since you have survived, even though you don't feel like it, this landslide, landslide again, your light is a lighthouse of brightness into others because you have you you have gotten the attention to all those many ships, i.e. people that are out there in the world that maybe were walking along their journey thinking nothing's ever going to happen to me. And now someone within their community, within their family, has had the most catastrophic thing happen. And that's been done to you and your family. And so therefore, what are you going to do with that? Right now, some of you may be saying, I don't want to do anything about it. I'm really ticked off at God. And that's okay. You know, he needs, you need to let him know that. And I think the sun is moving the shades up and down and it's making it look like it's like I'm a ghost here on this, on this video. So in the scripture, Psalm 51, 17, it says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. So God wants to break you down in a place of, not to hurt you, but to move you forward in what it is that he has for you, which is really, really good. And I know that that's really hard to believe, but please, ladies, remember, go back, and, and gentlemen, some of you, if, if your husbands are watching, if you go back to the Garden of Eden, right, and, and what had happened in the fall of sin. So what our choices are, what our kids' choices were, just the evilness, the fall of this world, things bad are going to happen. But God wants you. He wants all of you. He doesn't want you to separate yourself into compartments where you are at work and where you are in your room at night, what movies you decide to watch. He doesn't want you in like separate from when you're at church. He wants you to be that same person in every location. And we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. You know, I'm sure I lashed out at somebody on, on the road before because they cut me off. And I'm sure there's many of you on here that could probably vouch for that. But at the end of the day, God wants all of you. I mean, look at if you look at God's word, right? It's God inspired. And yet I was astonished to know where or just the people that he's chosen. Jeremiah was depressed and suicidal. Moses was a murderer, as was Paul. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. Peter rebuked God. Noah got drunk. Uh, Jacob was a liar. John Mark deserted Paul, David committed adultery, Elijah just plain burned out, Thomas doubted, and the list goes on and on. And these are all people that he wanted a conversation with. He chose, he chose them to make a difference in his kingdom. And so whatever it is that you've done, and or you feel you've done, or that you're holding on to, that is making you stuck and blocking the flow of the Holy Spirit, they all came through it because they trusted God. No one here on this earth is perfect. No one. They're going to probably put all these facades up in front of them to try to prove that they're perfect. They're going to try to, you know, wear things, do things. Everything's going to be different just to try to hide behind this brokenness, this weaknesses and our failures. I'm going to take a moment here and let's see, say hi to Rhonda and to Denise and Kathy Compton and Janet. Thanks you guys for, for being here. So let me just tell you this part that I love. Uh, many of you have heard of the famous TED uh, speaker, Brene Brown, and her quote says this, shame corrodes the very part of us that believes that we are capable of change. I'm going to read that again. Shame corrodes the very part of us that believes that we are capable of change. It's used. It's, it's, it's you. Shame wants you to seal the deal and says to be quiet. Guilt is I did something wrong. So just remember those two things. It's again, those are one of the tools, many of the tools that Satan's going to use in order. And it's like, what is the point of Satan, right? Why, why do we have to fight against Satan? Well, because God wants his specially chosen people that have gone through. We don't know what's, what's going on up there. We don't know. I mean, it's a perfect world. We know it's beautiful and golden streets and, and God just doesn't just want anybody to be up there. And we have to go through some of these things. And I know it sounds really harsh and it's terrible, but at the same time, I, I'm getting a text and I had to make sure somebody wasn't telling me that something was wrong with technology. Um, 
we just have to hold on to faith and to hope. So I'm going to just ask you directly, what shame are you holding on to? I mean, you can for sure share it here confidentially. Um, obviously something that if you don't want to share it here, that's fine. But if you want to, and you want to be held accountable for something, then this is a grieving mom's community and there should be no um, judgment here at whatsoever, because if it's not in one area, it's going to be in another. Um, hi, Shell. Hi, Linda. And so the other question is, do you truly feel that Jesus desires for you to remain stuck? I don't think so. Because you're of no use being in that place of being stuck. You're, you are, you're going to fall into one of those Ds. You're going to be more than likely depressed and discouraged and all those other things. And how will you be able to move forward if you continue wearing that scarlet letter on your lapel? Some deep questions, right? But I think it's about time that we get to this place and to really seek out and really desire to want to know, like, what's this all about? You're not going to have all the answers, but truly, you don't have to sit there and wait for those answers and live a miserable life until you to meet your maker and that you get to see your child again. So um, how do you do this, Jackie? <laughs> it's going to be the question. And I've started to give you some tools, but um, start asking yourself the deep questions. It's time to do your work. You know, it's, it's time to pray and ask to remove the deep hurts and the lies, to use your scripture, scripture as your comfort and a shield, work with a Christian counselor. Sometimes it's not fun for us to inflict pain onto ourselves, allow somebody else to do that. And when I say pain, it's temporary. You know, you've got, it's either you get through it at one long, hard shot or week or month, or if it takes a year, but it's either that, or you're going to have it forever until eternity. And that doesn't sound like a fun journey to me. And then of course, to connect with the moms here at Grieving Moms Finding Hope, there's a lot of conversation that we talk about with things like this. Um, I had a meeting with my leaders last night that it was just so joyful to see them all together and them sharing the questions and, and sharing part of their healing journey and giving them tips on how to talk to the other moms. Uh, but it's, it's a family. It's a, it's a safe place. And and no one's going to understand you as another grieving mom does. So those are some of the, the ideas. And so grace is given by someone else, and that is Jesus. That's who gives us grace. Shame is given by someone else that is not Jesus. And a lot of times it's ourselves. It's listening to the negative talk. It's listening to other people's opinions and things. And the only one that the grace that we want to hear is the grace that comes from Jesus. We don't want to be focusing on the shame because again, you guys, it's, it's more than likely it is a lie. Um, in John five, five through six, the question I always ask you guys is, so again, do you really want to be healed? I mean, in, in the story in John five, five through six, it talks about all of those, um, paralyzed and crippled people that were hanging around, you know, by the well and everybody's going to collect water. And, you know, they have gotten so used to being in that miserable place that it was very easy for them to ask somebody else to help them. Right. And then they didn't have to do the work and they just learned to stay in that place and never thinking about, well, I could actually walk myself and go down there. And is that possible? And then when Jesus met one of them, you know, the man said, will you heal me? And Jesus doubted that he really wanted to be healed because then who's going to go fetch his water for him? Who's going to give him the attention of the fact that he's crippled? You know, think about all those things. Like, and in our situation, I'm going to be very delicate with this. I understand that our situation, we, we need to be loved on. We need empathy and all of those things. And we need to have people, um, I don't, I don't like to have people, um, what is the words I always say? Um, sympathy is keeping us stuck. Empathy is, is coddling us and helping us in that moment, but encouraging us to go on. So that's when Jesus said, do you really want to get well? So do you really want to get well? 
and getting well, as I said, is, is going to take some work. And who wants to do work in the middle of grieving? Well, depending on where you are in the midst of your grieving is all going to be dependent because when Jesus says it's time, then it's time. You'll know it. You'll feel the nudge. You felt it before. And your, and your true healing, you guys, is not going to begin until that you do this deep house cleaning, which means, yep, picking up the rugs and taking them outside and shaking them and then cleaning underneath the rugs. It's, got, it's not going to be this surfacey cleaning around the rugs and, and barely you know, touching all those, those other areas like, oh, that's too much work. I don't want to touch that. But at the end of the day, you still know that that dirt is underneath that rug. I'm using a domestic like uh, analogy here because I figured that you you guys could all you could all relate to it. Um, at least I I absolutely believe Jesus wants me to grow and move forward. I choose to be courageous and see light through the darkness. Amen, Lisa. That's beautiful. Uh, and Luann saying I, that I I wasn't enough for my son and I failed him. That's a lie. I'm going to rebuke that right now. I'm going to rebuke that right now, um, Luann, and anybody else that is saying things like that. You've got to stop it, and you've got to rebuke it. How much more could you have been, truly? I mean, sure, there's going to be those moments that, you know, we, we may have uh, did say I love you when we hung up the phone and things, but you guys were human. Those kids knew how much that we loved them, and they had their own agenda going on, you know, um, they had their own walk with Jesus, or not, but Jesus walked there with them. He met those in, in those places of darkness. And for those of you that are questioning, like, whether your son or daughter is in heaven because, of, like, maybe they weren't believers, I want to encourage you to remember this. In that moment, before they took their last breath, or they just made a decision that maybe they were going to take their lives or they were sick or it was an accident. You don't know in that gleaming last moment, I sincerely believe that a lot of people will meet their maker and accept them. And as long as they have said, Jesus, I want to come home. I just feel so comforted in my heart. And I, I know my son was a believer. He walked with God his whole life, despite what happened in the very end. And I had people actually tell me, oh, your son's probably not in heaven. And oh my gosh, it was crushing to me. But I know my son. And Jesus knew my son, more importantly, right? Uh, Kathy saying, my shame is that I feel as though I have failed as being a mom who reared three adult children who have all suffered with substance abuse disorder. Did I not do enough to show them what God wants from them? Again, Kathy, I'm just going to rebuke that. You guys all, please, with me, rebuke these lies. These are lies, okay? These are lies. You loved your kids. The greatest of these is love. That is what Jesus wanted. Your kids knew that you loved them. And no family is perfect. No parent comes with an adult, like in a manual that says, this is exactly how it's going to happen, and this is exactly what you need to do. You just follow God's word, and if that's all you did, and even if you didn't, you didn't know Jesus until later, that's okay. You did the best that you can. So please, you guys, rebuke those statements right now. Uh, so if you have been told to be quiet, like Absalom told Tamar, even before the landslide, the day your child went home to heaven, this journey is going to be much more difficult. I'm just going to be honest with you. If there are things, if there are uh, skeletons in the closet, if there is unforgiveness, is there? if there is guilt and shame, and there is hatred towards other people. If that happened to you before this landslide, your work is going to be a little bit more challenging. I'm not going to, I don't like to say harder, uh, but it, it is possible, okay? It's possible because Jesus, again, is the healer. He is the counselor, and he does bring on people in our world to be able to help us to get through these things. I mean, I feel lately that I need to go back to counsel because I go through waves of time where I start to go into modes of things where I'm missing Randy terribly and the family's uh, things become too heavy and I put guilt on myself because I can't be there for everybody. Those are my, those are my challenges along with many others. Um, let's see. Adela is saying, guilt is feeling bad about poor decisions you make. Shame is feeling bad about who you are. Shame is a toxic disease that prevents you from assessing help and healing from beauty marks by Linda Barrett. That's beautiful. And she saying, I prayed for my son's body to be healed, but I have realized God did save my son, his soul. He is in heaven and God knows his heart. Amen, sister. Amen to that. Um, 
let's see here. Uh, so basically, it's time, you guys. Jesus is waiting, and he is crying alongside you. I had a good cry last night. I think it was just bottled up from a lot of different things. Uh, in fact, before I was going to get on the meeting, I had a major attack of things that were hitting me. And I knew, then I recognized it, and I went into my closet, I called my war room, and I sat down and I just rebuked it. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I said, you need to send Satan back to hell. Because I know what I'm going to do is be on this meeting to encourage these moms. I know one of the moms wants to help me out in a very big way, potentially, and things potentially are going to keep growing for the moms. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean growing financially. It means growing to reach other moms that are in the dark. Gosh darn it. I am not money driven, you guys. I just want to help all of you out there. And it's how it's helping me heal as well. Because again, I haven't made one cent off of grieving moms. And if you, any of you think that, uh, it's so not true. And I'm, why am I saying that? Because I know where my spiritual maturity is. A spiritually mature person is not going to be driven by finances to be able to be um, in their ministry. It wasn't in the trail angels. It wasn't, it's not in this ministry. I'm not money driven. God blesses me, gives me my daily manna to take care of what I need to take care of around here financially and um, has blessed me abundantly in that. So I, uh, I kind of made, made this little, this little rhyme or this little, uh, yeah, this little rhyme just says Satan uses suffer to buffer. Satan wants you to continue to suffer, to buffer you, to keep you away, to keep you distant from God, to keep you distant from other people. And he doesn't want you to share how God healed you. People want to know your story. They want to know how God has healed you. Maybe you're in the middle of that. Maybe you'd like to recommit your life, you know, right here tonight to Jesus and say, I trust you. I'm tired of feeling sick and tired. Then do so. And I will pray for you guys on here as well. And maybe when we're uh, done with this. Um, so that is that is shame in a nutshell. It's a lie. It's something that is just another tactic, another tool. And of course, as a mom, you know, moms are supposed to be um, the peacemakers, not the peacekeepers, right? But we tend to always want to be the peacekeeper, always trying to make sure that all of our little ducklings are in a row, that we did everything right. But we can't always do that. We're always going to take the blame and the shame because we're in the house and we have not the some some of us don't have the financial responsibility some of us have you know orchestrating some of us have both orchestrating what goes on in the home the safe place where the the dad comes home where the kids come home we are the safe place and we want to make it like a cozy sauna you know to get into a, like a warm hot bath have a nice home cooked meal that is what we love to do we are nurturers but we have to be nurturers as my friend told me and not saviors Okay, so by saying that we are responsible for our child's death and blaming ourselves and feeling shamed about maybe just not that, but anything in your past, rebuke it. It's time. Do you want to keep moving forward? Do you want to see? Because I'm just going to tell you, if you have survived this landslide, which if you're here, you have, that God has got something really special. Does it replace like your son or daughter's like life here? Absolutely not. But it's going to be pretty darn cool. So trust that. Um, and in closing, I want to remind you guys that we've got a retreat coming up. I don't like to just end it abruptly and then go into that, but I'm noticing the time. Uh, we have the re retreat here in Bend, Oregon, October 4th, 5th, and 6th. And I would love for you to be here. We've got a few ladies signed up. I can only take eight. Um, and that's for your benefit, not just for mine. I want to be able to give you the love and time and, and just um, be special have special moments here with you. And also I don't have that much space apart when um, we have moms that are purring, I would be one of those um, and allow you guys to sleep. So my little side funny on that, but I really, <coughs> hi Jane, thank you for being here. And Lisa, I can, I really hope that God has already, I know he's already got the ladies hand selected that are supposed to be here. Um, Aside from here, you guys, we have the Grieving Moms YouTube. You can go on the YouTube channel and you can see like, these uh, hope after landslide videos you can see some of the ones i've done out in nature you can see quite a lot of uh, other videos with moms that i've interviewed on here i've got the devotional the hope at sunrise devotionals that you can get into your own email and um and we also have an instagram and we're in the process of trying to figure out how to unblock instagram so that we can let 
the moms in because the social media platforms, as you know, um, you have to pay to play, and when you don't, your your audience is just limited. So uh, I'm going to be needing somebody to help me out with that. But in the meantime, uh, I hope, hope, hope that you guys are going to learn how to do your work to get through the shame and the blame, to begin your healing journey, to know that there is life after the landslide, life above the landslide, and that you're pretty darn incredible. You know that, right? And if you don't, you, you need to know that. I have to tell myself I'm incredible because there, there are days, you guys, that I cry so hard. It, it's an ugly cry, and I don't like it. And I'm so thankful that I have people around me that can comfort me and love on me and, and tell me the same thing. But I also need to be in a grieving mom's group too, and I get to do that with a lot of you. So if you're interested in being a, one of those that are on Zoom, you can certainly do that on grievingmoms.com. Uh, the Grieving Moms Resurfacing book is on Amazon. These are all tools, you guys. Again, this is not a commercial. These are tools for you. And I, I wrote the book in a treehouse in Hawaii. It was tough work, and it really was, even though it was in Hawaii, there was a lot of attacks there because God just knew that this was going to be something to be able to help a good many of you, and I am humbled by that. So I love you guys. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here, and I will go back and address some of these comments.